Hello, in this video we are going to solve for the low Reynolds number flow around a translating sphere. So first of all, let's define the problem at hand. Uh, we have a sphere that is translating at a certain velocity, um, like this. Okay, so that sphere is going at a velocity that is minus u e x. Um, and it's going, it's traveling through the air, for instance, through a medium. Um, instead of considering this problem, which is very complicated to solve, uh, what we will do instead is to change the referential and place ourselves uh, in uh, the uh, referential of the sphere. So what we are going to consider is that the sphere is not translating anymore. Uh, it's maintained static here at this point but that the, 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 the fluid around it it's translating, is translating in the other direction, therefore I, at the speed u e x. Okay? So this flow, this sphere translating to the left within a medium, within a fluid medium that is static, uh, whose background is static, can be turned into uh, the problem where the, the sphere, uh, the, uh, the opposite problem is the sphere is static and the flow is driven by the boundary conditions at the wall of that sphere, at the boundary of that sphere, uh, with velocity u in the ex direction. Because this problem is a spherical problem, uh, we are going to define uh, spherical coordinates. So first of all, I'm going to define my radial vector, vector er, which also defines here this angle, which I will call theta, and that uh, unit vector, which therefore is e theta, because this will be my these will be uh, my uh, my reference frame, and we are going to assume that in the phi direction, so the direction across the sphere in this direction, um, we are cons we're going to consider that the flow is invariant, so there is nothing going on in this direction. So u x can be expressed in this e r e theta basis by uh, essentially projecting. Uh, the ex vector, the ex vector onto this basis. And so by doing this, we get u cos theta er uh, minus u sine theta e theta. Um, and that would essentially give us boundary conditions for the, for the fluid um, on the sphere, on the walls of the sphere. So the assumptions that we're making is that the flow is two-dimensional. That is to say that I will write u, my velocity vector, uh, as having a component that depends on r and theta in the er direction. And it also has a component, which I'll call v, depending on r and theta as well in the e theta direction okay so that will be my uh, that will be my uh, first sort of um, ansatz here so this is our first um, 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 hypothesis for the flow we're assuming that this is a flow that happens at slow value at small value of the Reynolds number so um, we'll we'll just start start down by writing uh, the navier stokes equation which in one possible non-dimensional form writes the Reynolds number like this uh, times d u star by d t star where my star the quantity refer to non-dimensional version of the uh, underlying quantity the velocity here the time here plus u star dot grad star u star and this is equal to minus grad star b star plus we're in non-dimensional form so that's going to be the Laplacian star so not a star sorry times u star and we place ourselves in the uh, limit of small Reynolds numbers so because we're at small Reynolds number that this term is very small and we can neglect it uh, which yields this equation a zero in vector form is minus grad star p star plus the Laplacian of u star. 
And that equation, which or I can write in dimensional form or in a dimensional In dimensional form, that essentially writes uh, 0 equals minus grad p plus mu the viscosity, the dynamic viscosity, times the Laplacian of u. And that equation is known as the Stokes equation, which is the uh, low Reynolds number pendant of the Navier Stokes equation. As you can see, we've removed the inertial terms. Um, and essentially, we will be solving uh, for this flow around that sphere uh, in the context of the Stokes equation or a flow commonly known as Stokes flow or creeping flow past the sphere. Okay? So, uh, using uh, the um, ansatz that we wrote here and um, a formula sheet on uh, the Navier-Stokes equation or the Stokes equation or these how to write these operators in uh, spherical coordinates uh, we can write down, we can reduce these Navier-Stokes equation or actually augment them given uh, their form uh, into the following uh, into the following equations. So using the flow ansatz 1 uh, the Stokes equation uh, becomes, and I'm going to write it down in component form uh, for you know a bit more to keep as much information information as possible. So mu over r squared times d by dr of r squared du by dr plus 1 over sine theta d by d theta sine theta du by d theta minus 2u minus 2 dv by d theta minus 2v over tan theta minus dp by dr equals 0. And I'm going to get back to this equation uh, later. I will label this 2 for further reference. Uh, that's the uh, equation in the radial direction. And now we can look at the orthoradial direction e theta. Um, and the other component uh, then yields mu over r squared uh, times d by dr r squared dv by dr plus 1 over sine theta. Uh, times d by d theta sine theta dv by d theta plus 2 du by d theta minus v over sine squared theta minus 1 over r dp by d theta equals 0. And again, given the length of this expression, I'm going to have to label it and get back to it in a moment. And lastly, when we solve for these flows, the Stokes equation, uh, typically uh, the incompressibility constraint follows. So I will complement the system uh, with the incompressibility condition. Again, in spherical form. So you take your, uh, you take your uh, favorite formula sheet and you can read it out from there. So it is the it is the divergence of the velocity that is zero that vanishes, um, and in this context, in this two-dimensional form of, of the spherical coordinates, what we get is one over r squared d by dr r squared u plus one over r sine theta times d by d theta v sine theta equals zero and I label label this for uh, for further uh, reference. Okay, so uh, one of the first um, assumptions that we can make here, um, and this is one that is that's going to help us considerably simplify the flow. These equations look really nasty. 
uh, is to look at these boundary conditions. And of course, our solution has to satisfy these boundary conditions. So, well, based on these, uh, based on these boundary conditions, Based on the boundary conditions, what we are supposed to do here is to propose uh, a solution that uh, will automatically project on the sine and the cosine basis here uh, for the specific components. So what we are going to do is we're going to, based on the boundary condition, uh, we can posit that u is going to be a function of r times cos theta so that's the u here, the velocity in the er direction. So I'm extracting this, state, this cos theta here. And I'm also going to do the same for v, g of r times sine theta to extract this sine theta and essentially provide v in the correct place. So this is, well, this is an ansatz. This is another hypothesis that we made here. Uh, and that will allow us to, to, to find an, a, a simple solution for this flow configuration. Um, and so based on this writing, the boundary conditions become boundary conditions become that at, uh, oh, I haven't defined the size of, uh, of, the, of the sphere. So the size of the sphere, I'm going to define the sphere of radius A. Okay, so this is radius A. So what we are going to write here is that the velocity at A has to be equal to u cos theta e r minus u sine theta e theta. Based on this, um, uh, based on this form for the flow, that gives me that f of A has to be equal to u. That also gives me that g of A has to be equal to minus u, so that these boundary, set, these boundary conditions are satisfied. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention that here, the flow is driven by the velocity at the boundary. Uh, far away from the sphere, the, flow has to have, the fluid has to have no velocity. It is entirely driven by the velocity at this boundary. And so what we are going to have is that uh, the limits, when r tends to infinity of f of r, has to be equal to the limits when r tends to infinity of g of r and it has to be equal to zero so that the fluid velocity vanishes far away from uh, the from the, the the walls of the sphere so based on this change of variables here uh, we can uh, try and plug th these uh, new variables into equation two three four and instead of working with u v and p we can now try and work with f g and whatever p becomes and we'll see what, what happens to this quantity in a second. So let's just, let's just do it, and let's just plug uh, these assumptions into the equation, starting with the simplest one, which is equation 4. So uh, 4, uh, if I plug u equals f of r cos theta and, and v equals g of r sine theta, uh, that equation becomes, so it will become um, 2 over r f cos theta plus f prime cos theta plus 2 over r g cos theta equals 0. And I can multiply everything by uh, r over 2 and uh, divided by theta, by cos theta as well, uh, to simplify this equation into the more tractable f plus r over 2 f prime plus g equals 0. And again, that equation, I'm going to get back to it in a moment. So I'll label this 5. Okay. Now we pause for a second, and what we can look uh, by, uh, what we can see by looking at equation 2 is uh, that this term here uh, is proportional to um, cos theta. du by dr is proportional to cos theta, d by dr of that is proportional to cos theta. Uh, that's going to be uh, a sine theta, which differentiated with theta is going to give us sine theta cos theta divided by sine theta, which is cos theta. This is proportional to cos theta. This is sine theta differentiated with theta, so this is cos theta. 
And similarly, this is going to give us uh, the tangent is sine over cos. So we got a cos up there and the sine simplify. So everything is proportional to cos theta. So we'll, well, obviously, dp by dr has to be proportional to cos theta. And so uh, what we are going to say is that 2 implies that p um, or dp by dr is proportional to cos theta, but I'm going to say that uh, p is proportional to cos theta. And in that case, I can write that the pressure uh, is a constant, p0, plus h of r, I'm introducing a new quantity here, uh, h of r cos theta. Okay, and that is essentially going to be my ansatz. I will plug that into equation 2 and equation 3 and I'll see what these equations become. So let's do that. So uh, first of all, equation 2 with that ansatz in gives us, that's going to be uh, quite laborious, so mu divided by r squared d by dr r squared f prime cos theta plus 1 over sine theta d by d theta uh, of minus f sine squared theta minus 2 f cos theta minus 2 g cos theta minus 2 g cos theta um, close the parentheses minus h prime cos theta equals 0 <coughs> So, and I introduced this prime to be the d by dr, right? So r is the only variable that, um, that, is, uh, th that is variable for f, g, and h. And so when I write f prime, g prime, or h prime, it's the differentiation with respect to uh, that quantity. Um, okay, so I can simplify this line a little bit further and say that this is mu over r squared d by dr r squared f prime minus 2f minus 2f minus 2g minus 2g minus h prime equals 0. And I can at last write it in a bit of a nicer way by still keeping mu over r squared out um, and then writing that this is d by dr r squared f prime minus 4f minus 4g minus h prime equals zero. Okay, that's the simplest form uh, for equation two that I can reach at this stage. And so I'm going to label this six. So we can see that these ansatzes that, uh, ansatzen that we've, uh, we've done so far, uh, here and there, uh, allow us to simplify drastically that massively complicated equation into this more, you know, friendly looking um, uh, uh, ODE. So let's keep doing that. Let's look at what equation 3 becomes. So 3 under the same ansetzen uh, become mu over r squared uh, times d by dr of r squared g prime sine theta uh, plus 1 over sine theta d by d theta g cos theta sine theta minus 2f sine theta uh, minus g sine theta over sine theta, sorry, minus g over sine theta. Um, close the parentheses, plus 1 over r h sine theta equals 0. And let's continue in the same spirit to simplify this equation. So what we get here is mu over r, parentheses, d by dr, r squared, g prime. I'm dividing everything by sine theta to see if I can simplify everything out. Um, minus g plus g of the cos squared theta over sine squared theta, minus 2f minus g over sine squared theta plus h equals 0. 
trying to isolate the idea behind, uh, be, behind what I'm doing here and multiplying by this by R is to isolate this H here so that I can try and combine these later on with equation 6. Um, and of course, um, um, of course I can express this as a tangent uh, or, uh, or I can express this cos squared as 1 minus sine squared and the benefit of doing that is the 1 over square of sine squared is going to simplify with this guy. So let's do this. Um, so what that gives me is mu over r d by dr r squared g prime uh, minus g. Okay, so what we have here is that g over sine squared simplifying here. So I've got minus 2f here and then the last term coming out of here is, uh, well, minus g actually, uh, plus h equals 0. And so I can combine these g's and write that this equation becomes mu over r d by dr r squared g prime uh, minus 2f minus 2g plus h equals 0. And that's my equation 7. So at this stage, what we have done is starting from the Navier-Stokes equation in the limit of small Reynolds number, which becomes the Stokes equation. We've essentially written this down uh, into uh, component form in spherical um, coordinates here. This is 2 and 3. Added the incompressibility condition in the same coordinate frame. That's equation 4. And based on the boundary condition, we've made some assumptions on the form of the flow. And that allowed us to reduce these horrendous equations into uh, equation 5, 6, and 7, uh, which are uh, already far more tractable. So what we're going to do now is get rid of this h quantity. It's, appear it's not appearing in equation 5, but it's appearing very simply here by its, its derivative in equation 6 and uh, by uh, this term here in equation 7. So uh, what we're going to do is differentiate equation 7 and then add equation 6 to it. That would get us rid of, of h. So d7 by dr gives us <coughs> minus mu over r squared into rg prime plus r2g prime prime minus 2f minus 2g plus mu over r 2g prime plus 2rg prime prime plus 2rg prime prime plus r squared g triple prime minus 2f prime minus 2g prime plus h prime equals 0. Okay, so that's, the, that's 7 differentiated. Um, and, well, the plan is to have this guy appear here, h prime, so that by summing the resulting equation with equation 6, we can get rid of h altogether. So what we're doing here is taking this equation and adding equation 6. And that gives us something that is going to be long again. So mu over r squared 2r f prime plus r squared f double prime uh, minus 4f minus 4g minus 2rg prime minus r2g prime prime plus 2f plus 2g that's the end for the terms that are proportional to mu over r squared and now I have the terms that are proportional to mu over r which are 2g prime plus 2rg prime prime uh, plus 2rg prime prime plus r squared g triple prime minus 2f prime minus 2g prime and that's it. Okay, now that we've gotten rid of h, the pressure doesn't influence our calculation anymore um, and we can try and reduce this equation to something that is a bit more simple. Uh, so let me just multiply everything by r over mu so if I multiply everything by r with the pen that works, uh, by r over mu, I get 2f prime uh, plus rf prime prime 
uh, minus 2 over Rf minus 2 over Rg minus 2g prime minus Rg prime prime uh, plus 2g prime plus 4rg prime prime plus r squared g triple prime minus 2f prime minus 2g prime equals 0. Um, and I'll, let me just group terms depending on their, uh, their, the, 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 their derivative, the number of derivatives involved. So that gives us um, rf prime prime uh, minus 2 over r f plus r squared g triple prime plus 3 r g prime prime minus 2 g prime minus 2 over r g equals 0. And this is probably as much as I can do here, so I'm going to call this equation equation 8. Okay, so what we've done so far. Uh, is so we have we stated the problem provided these ansatz and zitzen for the form of the flow uh, with the pressure as well and then we've uh, essentially reduced the incompressibility condition to equation five and then the stokes equation to six and seven we combine six and seven um, and uh, and for from six and seven we got eight okay so eight involves now f and g and their derivatives. But, well, we're lucky because equation 5 gives us g directly as a function of f and its derivatives. So how about we just use equation 5 to express g and uh, its derivatives. So 5 gives us that g equals minus f minus r over 2f prime. Uh, and so based on this, uh, we can write that so we have that g prime, and we need g prime, g double prime, and g triple prime. So g prime equals uh, minus f prime minus one half of f prime minus r over two f prime prime. So in other words, minus three halves of f prime minus r over two f double prime. In the same way, I can get g double prime um, and uh, that is going to give me minus 2 f prime prime minus r over 2 f triple prime and I can get g triple prime as uh, minus 5 halves of f triple prime plus uh, minus sorry r over 2 of f quadruple prime okay so that came out from 5, and uh, let me remind you that the equation that we're working with now is equation 8, which, is, uh, which involves f and g with their derivatives. We've expressed g and its derivatives as a function of f and its, and, and, and its derivatives. So what we're going to do is take g, is take 8, and replace all the occurrences of g and, their, and its derivatives by their expressions here. So let me just do that, unfortunately, on the other side of, of, of the page. So into 8. So what we get is, um, so into 8, so we've got Rf prime prime minus 2 over R F, And then we are starting to plug R squared G triple prime, which is this. Uh, term here. So that gives us minus 5 r squared over 2 f triple prime minus r cubed over 2 f quadruple prime. Then we have that term 3 r g double prime which gives us minus 6 r f double prime minus 3 r squared over 2 f triple prime. That was this guy. Then we have minus 2 g prime. g prime is expressed here, so that's going to simply simplify the uh, denominator here. 
uh, with a minus sign to bear in mind. So that's plus 3f prime plus rf double prime. Um, and the last term that we have is minus 2 over r times g. g is this guy here. Minus 2 over r gives us uh, plus 2 over r f double f no prime. Minus the plus 2 over r f um, plus f prime. And this is equal to 0. That's our equation 8. Uh, in which I have uh, injected g and its derivatives as a function of f and its derivatives. So based on this equation, we can um, furthermore simplify this by grouping the terms with the same uh, degree of differentiation. Um, and that gives us, uh, try putting the highest derivative first, uh, we have minus r cubed over 2f quadruple prime then we have triple primes, we have minus 4r squared f triple prime, then we have minus 4r f double prime, then plus 4f prime equals 0. And then because I always like to have a you know, unit coefficient in front of my highest derivative, I'm just going to multiply everything by minus 2 over r cubed to give me f quadruple prime plus 8 over r f triple prime plus 8 over r squared f double prime minus 8 over r cubed f prime equals zero. And that's a much simpler equation. First of all, this equation, so we started, remember, we started from the Navier-Stokes or the Stokes equation, which looked horrendous with the incompressibility condition written here. We made some Anzitsen. We've essentially combined these equations in a uh, clever way and reduced all that mess to a simple equation for one quantity, so it's an ODE, okay, ordinary differential equation for f, uh, with non-constant coefficients, these r's there, but it only involves f. There's no pressure, there's no two-component of velocity anymore. So it's just one equation. And we are going to try and solve this equation. So we are actually lucky because this equation is a uh, canonical equation. It's a, an equation called Cauchy equation. Um, and you can see this because this is the highest order derivative, it has no, uh, no um, powers of r in front of it. This is minus 1 in terms of its um, in, in, in the, the degree of differentiation, and it has 1 over r. Minus 2 compared to the highest derivative, it's 1 over r squared. Minus 3 compared to the highest derivative, and it's r to the minus 3. Okay? So this is a typical form, this is a typical equation called a Cauchy equation. And it has solutions that are of the form uh, r to the power m, okay? And so if we plug uh, this r to the power m in uh, this equation, uh, then we can get a we can get a, a a characteristic equation that will help us determine m. So what well, we can do this. So that would have been equation nine, I believe, of uh, eight. So this is nine. So this is 9. So if I put uh, into 9, what I get here is uh, m times m minus 1 times m minus 2 times m minus 3 times r to the power m to the, uh, to the power m minus 4 plus 8 over r times m m minus 1 m minus 2 r to the m minus 3 plus 8 over r squared m m to the minus 1 times r to the m minus 2 minus 8 over r3 m r to the m minus 1 equals 0. And uh, well that can be simplified uh, first of all by just getting rid of all these r to the m minus 4, this is r to the m minus 4, r to the m minus 4, and r to the m minus 4. 
uh, this is because this is a Cauchy equation and then that ends at here allows us to do that. So that gives us simplifying by the uh, powers of R, we get m, m minus 1, m minus 2, m minus 3, plus 8, m, m minus 1, m minus 2, uh, where am I, plus 8, m, m minus 1, minus 8, m equals 0. Okay, just replay, simplifying by these powers of r. Um, and well, now we can just solve uh, for for this for this um, for this for this equation. Um, and what I get is just first of all, I can factorize everything by m. So by factorizing by m, I get m fact as a prefactor of m minus one, m minus two, m minus three, uh, plus eight, um, m minus one, m minus two plus 8, m minus 1, minus 8, equals 0. Uh, that gives me 8, m uh, minus 2, and that gives me that m minus 2 um, as a sort of prefactor of everything. So I can just factorize everything by m minus 2. And what I get in my parentheses is um, m minus 1, m minus 3, and uh, plus 8, m minus 1, plus 8, um, equals 0. And this is a bit more complicated than to deal with, so, um, well, what, I, what we can do is express, is just expand this polynomial here. Um, so it gives us m, m minus, it's two here. And then inside this parentheses, uh, what I get is uh, m squared plus four m plus three equals zero. Um, and then from there, we can just write down the solutions. Uh, the solutions are either m equals zero, which is here, or m equals 2, which is this monomial, and then this polynomial here is going to give me two solutions. Uh, the first one is, um, so not this one, it's m equals minus 1. And if m mi equals minus 1 is a solution, then the other solution has to be m equals minus 3. Okay, and that's very simply solve this fourth order polynomial. Here we've got these four uh, possibilities and because we've got these four possibilities then the solution uh, to this equation to 9 has to write uh, as a linear combination of these four uh, possible solution that is to say k1 times r squared plus k2 plus k3 over r plus k4 over r cubed. So that will be the the way that that would be the, the way that the, the solution of this equation writes in its most general form. So now let's dig up the uh, boundary conditions again. Uh, so we had written them down a long time ago and they're written here. So you can remember that the limit when r tends to infinity if f is zero. So the boundary condition limit when r tends to infinity of f of r equals zero essentially tells us that k1 equals k2 equals zero um, and uh, that gives us a very quick uh, simplification of that, uh, of that function um, because then f of r uh, is just k3 over r plus k 4 over r cubed, which we have k3 and k4 have to be determined. Uh, but if you remember, we had an expression for g that's going to help us in a second because we will have one boundary condition for f at r equals a, uh, which is this one, and we need a second one g at r equals a, which is here. So we need to express g. So remember that g 
uh, that g equals it was there and we wrote it down here minus f uh, minus uh, r over 2 times f prime um, and so what that means is this minus k 3 over r minus k 4 over r cubed minus r over 2 uh, minus k 3 over r 2 minus r over 2 minus 3 over r to the fourth k 4 uh, in other words, if I combine these, uh, these terms, what I get is minus k3 over 2r plus k4 over 2r cubed. Okay, so that is essentially g. So we have f, we have g. Um, now we can just apply the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions... The boundary conditions at the walls of the sphere. Uh, remember that they read f of a equals u and g of a equals minus u. Um, and so if I um, write the first one, f of a equals u, I get k3 over a plus k4 over a cubed equals u. If I write g of a equals minus u, that gives me minus k3 over 2a plus k4 over 2a cubed equals minus u. Okay, now I can combine these two expressions. I can actually add them up to get the u to, 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 to get rid of the u. So if I do this I get k3 over 2a plus 3k4 over 2a cubed equals 0. Uh, that is to say k3 equals minus 3k4 over a squared. Yeah. Um, and now that I've got k3, I can just plug k3 back into that first equation. Okay, and uh, obtain k4 in this fashion. So that gives minus 3k4 over uh, a2, a3, uh, plus k4 over a3 equals u, um, which eventually gives me that k4 equals minus u a cubed over 2. That's right, yeah. Okay, so we've got k3, we've got k4. Uh, no, we don't have k3. And so I need to plug this k4 in here to get k3. So again, and that gives me that k3 equals the two minuses uh, simplify, and I get 3ua over 2. And I've got k3, I've got k4. That should give me uh, f and g. f is, is written here g is written here. Remember that to get back to the velocity I need to multiply f by uh, cos theta and g by sine theta. And that will give me the r component of the velocity and the theta component of the velocity. So, well I just have to replace these terms in uh, and write down my velocity. So the velocity eventually reads u of r and theta, it's f of r, I'll replace these guys in, times cos theta. So that's going to be, and I can also factor out the u, um, so that's going to be capital U, and these terms are going to read uh, 3a over 2r minus a cubed over 2r cubed times cos theta. And in a similar fashion I can determine v of r and theta Again, I'm factoring, factoring everything actually by minus u for v because of the boundary condition um, that is here. So I'll take the minus in the minus out here, and where is v? That's g here. Okay. 
and these are the coefficients. So that will give me 3a over 4r um, plus a cubed over 4r cubed times sine theta. Okay. And this is the final solution. Uh, we can continue and express uh, from these, we can continue and express a lot of things. We can express the pressure uh, by uh, essentially writing down that h from equation 7, h is minus that term here. I will spare you these calculations here. But then from the pressure, we can also uh, express the forces acting on the sphere, which is uh, also a very interesting uh, thing to do. But this is essentially it. I wanted to calculate here the, um, the uh, uh, low Reynolds number or the Stokes or creeping flow uh, past this sphere, a translating sphere. In this video, we've taken the approximations of low Reynolds number uh, in the context of the flow past the sphere that is being translated or moving. Um, we've calculated, we've essentially written down the equations in the spherical coordinate frame um, and ended up very complicated, but we found a strategy to simplify them and ended up finding the velocity in the end. This concludes this uh, video on uh, the flow past a translating sphere.